Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Ebowitz. Joining us today is Dr. Murray Sabrin. He was a professor of finance at Ramapo College in New Jersey, where he is now Professor Emeritus. As a libertarian, he was the first third-party candidate in the history of New Jersey to join the debate stage with the two major party candidates. He is also the author of several books and articles, including... Let me find it here. From Immigrant to Public Intellectual, An American Story. Welcome, Dr. Sabrin. Well, thank you, Michael. It's always great to be with a fellow traveler, so to speak. So from what I gather, you are an adherent of the Austrian School of Economics and more particularly, or in particular, rather, the Austrian theory of the trade cycle. Would that be an accurate assessment? Yeah, I based it on, uh, yeah, I, what I did was uh, I learned about the Austrian school, I guess, in the early 70s when I came across Murray Rothbard's um, wonderful op-ed in the New York Times right after Nixon did wage price controls. And he laid out the argument against wage price controls and why Nixon uh, severing the last link between the dollar and gold was a huge mistake. And of course, it was because we've had uh, inflation ever since then. And then I started reading up on it. In 1974, I went to the Foundation for Economic Education, which was then located at the on Irvington on Hudson, and I picked up uh, his economic treatise, Man, Economy, and State, Ludwig von Mises, The Theory of Money and Credit, and a whole bo a host of other books, and I started reading them. And I was in a PhD program at Rutgers at the time, and this was, again, this was the uh, the oil embargo, the, uh, the skyrocketing oil prices, the double-digit inflation, and um, I was looking for a, a topic to, in the geography department that would allow me to incorporate economics and ge geographic concepts. And I came across Murray Rothbard's discussion of money and banking, of how money is injected into the economy and that spreads through the banking system, causing inflation and the boom bust cycle. And I said, aha, there's my doctoral dissertation, how money affects local economies. Because usually we look at the economy from a macro perspective, GDP, um, inflation, uh, unemployment, but the macro economy is composed of what? All the individual economies we have in the country, the New York metropolitan region, uh, the Boston, Chicago, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I said, this would be a great topic because at that time, the data were available from the Bureau of Labor Statistics and they had data on inflation and uh, employment, unemployment, and so on and so forth. And this all came together for me after being an undergraduate student in the 1960s just taking a couple economics courses, but really re getting interested in the economy, why we had uh, downturns called recessions. And um, I started looking for a way to explain this. And the Austrian school just explained it beautifully, seamlessly. And it has a long tradition, as you know, Michael, going back to 1870 with the publication of uh, the Principles of Economics by Karl Menger, who discussed the uh, in money. And, um, and then his uh, student, Mises, picked that up and wrote the uh, theory of money and credit in 1912. And so for the past 50 plus years, I've been writing about this um, in books in articles and giving talks, speeches, and of course, interviews like yours on podcasts and radio and TV, and to educate the public. Uh, having been a professor for 35 years, my job is to educate as many people as possible now that I'm retired from the classroom. And of course, the classroom only gives you a very small group of uh, individuals to uh, learn about this. And so having the opportunity to go across the country, in fact, across the globe uh, on podcasts is a wonderful way to educate people about a subject they know very little about. They know something's wrong, but they can't pinpoint the, the reasons for it. And it all comes down to the Federal Reserve manipulating interest rates and creating money. Now, the standard explanation of inflation, or rather maybe the monetarist uh, view of inflation, is that the Federal Reserve injects money into the economy and it causes a general rise in the price level. And then when the Fed puts the brakes on it, it causes a general suppression of the price level. Hence, we have a recess recession. But the Austrian theory is far more dynamic than that. Can you explain to us some of the inner workings of the Austrian theory as explained by Mises in the theory of money and credit and then Hayek in prices and production and yeah, Rothbard, really of course, afterwards. Yeah, it really has to do with interest rates because the interest rate, uh, the Austrians explained it as the price of time, or we like to say the price of money. 
So if there's a lot of savings in the economy, great time helpful. preference, right? Time preference. Time preference. It all comes down to time preference. I tell my students, you tell me that the interest rate in a country and I will tell you what the economy is like. So we know countries like Argentina uh, and other countries that have uh, virulent inflation because of money printing, interest rates are sky high. Well, in the United States, the, um, the way it works is the Federal Reserve buys government securities, that's through open market operations. Uh, and so that money goes into the banking system, the reserves of the banks go up, the banks have now more cash than they have uh, demand for. So what do they do? They lower interest rates. And the Fed is also manipulating interest rates by open uh, by focusing on the Fed funds rate, which is the uh, overnight lending uh, rate that banks charge each other for loans. So you have two things going on, pumping money into the banking system with uh, reserves, and then manipulating interest rates at the short end of the yield curve with, um, with their uh, manipulation. So what that does is, if you're an entrepreneur and you see rates go down, well, what do we know from Finance 101? When rates go down, the present value of future income streams go up. It's the, it's the discounting mechanism. And so when that happens, businessmen think that there's more savings in the economy than there really is. And so they say, okay, I'm going to take on a project that didn't look so great at 6% interest, but at 3% interest, it really looks great because I can borrow money and I will reap the benefits of uh, the future income streams. So they engage in uh, longer term projects, whether it's mining, whether it's building a new factory, adding new equipment. And so you get a boom in the capital goods industries. That's really one of the keys of the Austrian school. It's not just looking at the macro picture in terms of data, but looking at the actual uh, real economy as to what's happening with the business decision makers. And so you get a boom in, in commodity prices, in uh, machinery prices, cap all sorts of capital goods prices, real estate prices. So that, so that continues, and that can continue for many years, like it did in the 1920s, like it did in the, in the uh, 1960s. And so you get this boom, and then when the Fed realizes that inflation is rising, they start putting the brakes on, as you alluded to before. And as interest rates go up, some of these companies that have borrowed short term to fund these long term projects realize these projects are not sustainable. And that's when they start liquidating those projects. They've hired workers to work on those projects. So they lay off workers, unemployment goes up. So that's the sort of the general outline of the business cycle from the Austrian's perspective, but also as Macy's pointed out, that the consumer is also affected as well. People buy uh, Big ha bigger houses than they otherwise would. They buy more expensive cars. They borrow money uh, on credit cards for uh, increase their consumption. So the consumers also affect. In fact, Mises in his treatise Human Action talks about this, about how the whole uh, economy is affected by cheap interest rates, but primarily it's the capital goods sector. And recently we've seen the high tech companies uh, hire a lot of workers during the COVID lockdown, which threw a monkey wrench into the whole boom bust cycle because it's sort of uh, we had a short downturn, which was not a typical boom bust cycle downturn. It was because of the lockdowns and then the Fed f flooded the economy with money. So that that allowed another boom to continue. And the Amazons of the world and the other high tech companies hired a lot of people. And uh, even today, it's uh, Amazon announced it's laying off more people. So companies in the high tech area, which thrive on low interest rates, they were hiring left and right. Salesforce hired a whole bunch of people. Uh, you just go down a list of all the companies that uh, 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 Meta, the, the parent of Facebook, they're laying off tens of thousands of people. So you, you get to see the distortions. This is what the uh, Austrians say. The distortions in the economy come about because of this cheap money policy, which is unsustainable. And that's where the I think the monetarists and the Keynesians uh, missed the boat, is that these policies of the Fed and of course, the federal uh, government doesn't help by spending so much money, creates an, an economy that is not based upon organic growth, be, based on savings and investment. And that's the real issue we, we're facing in this country. And the banking problem is just a, a reflection of the easy money policies and, of course, fractional reserve, which we can get into. Now, of course, you have the, you know, the partisan stripes are showing on both sides of the political aisle. So when we had this recent bout of inflation, of course, the uh, Trump supporters blame Biden and Biden blames structural issues or uh, supply chain issues. Now, I remember when Trump was in office, when he was putting pressure on Jerome Powell to keep interest rates low. Mm hmm. 
And he also did an awful lot of spending, you know, deficit spending. And to me, you can't just ignore that when figuring out what caused the inflation. It's not to say that the Biden administration's innocent, but politicians on both sides of the aisle have been responsible for this for many years, correct? No question about it. I mean, uh, the party out of power always blames the party in power for uh, for inflation and uh, wild spending. But both parties are responsible. You look at the budget for the last 75 years and it's gone up under both Democrats and, and Republicans. In fact, someone recently did a study to show that the, uh, the budget increases slower under Democratic administrations than it does under Republican administrations. So for Republicans to say that the party of fiscal discipline doesn't square <laughs> with the with the with the data and the historical record and the deficits seem to be greater under Republicans than uh, Democrats in terms of percentage of GDP, which is a flawed uh, um, variable, as we know. But yeah, I, in, the, in the Wall Street Journal today, there is an article talking about the Biden inflation. Well, no, the money supply exploded in 2020 when Trump was president. That's right. So to say that it's the Biden inflation is, is I think, mischaracterizes the, the problem because it's about money creation. Now, there's a theory out there or an explanation that it's really fiscal policy that drives inflation, the Fed's policy. Well, the Fed is supposed to be independent. They keep on telling us all the time, the Fed is an independent agency. So if the Fed is independent, if the federal government is spending trillions of dollars it doesn't have, then they have to borrow the money from the public and the Fed should not be buying any of this debt called monetizing the debt. They should just allow the private markets to provide the funds for the federal government to balance its budget. And so, um, the, the politics of this is, is really remarkable because uh, no one wants to tell the truth in Washington that, that when uh, Clinton was running in 92, the, the campaign motto, it's the economy stupid, from my perspective and other people's perspective, it's the Fed stupid. It's all about printing money and manipulating interest rates. And that's why uh, Ron Paul had it right, end the Fed, abolish the Fed, go back to a commodity-based money, which is gold. The dollar was originally defined in the 1790s as one twentieth of an ounce of gold because of so much money printing. Uh, the dollar would be defined somewhere in the tens of thousands of an ounce of gold because, I mean, we have $22 trillion in M2 money supply, which is cash, checking accounts, and savings accounts. So if you want to have the dollar as good as a strong dollar, you have to have the dollar as good as gold because that's what people in the back of the mind, realize there's something backing up the dollar and it's not the Federal Reserve, it's not the Treasury. It, in the old days, it was gold. And that's why people trusted the do uh, dollar because they could redeem their dollars for gold. We no longer have that. Now we can only redeem our dollars for our dollars. And we have, I think, the, the worst of both worlds. We have fiat money, runaway spending, manipulating interest rates, trade restrictions, uh, massive regulation of the economy. And so we basically have as uh, people have argued for several decades since the New Deal, we have economic fascism in America. And that's something that no one wants to talk about in Washington, D.C., because both parties are culpable. By economic fascism, I'm assuming you mean where people have a, a ownership of their property, but can't, but the government dictates how that property is going to be used. Correct. Is that what you mean? I just want to make sure that it's clear. So sure. I mean, the banking system is a good example of that, of cronyism. I think another word for economic fascism is cronyism, where uh, the financial elites really govern the country by choosing who's going to be president and senators and members of Congress, because they have super PACs and donate money to these uh, candidates who they want to do their bidding for the private uh, companies. So that is the American type of fascism that we have today. In fact, there was a book published in 1975 nearly 50 years ago called uh, America's Emerging Fascist Economy. So the evidence has been building for decades since the New Deal. In fact, uh, uh, John T. Flynn wrote a book called As We Go Marching, and the subtitle is The Coming uh, Economic uh, Fascism in America. So analysts who are objective in, in discussing the economy from the perspective of supply, demand, and uh, uh, banking policy, sound banking policy, trade policy, what have you, realize that what we have today is nothing more than cronyism run amok. I mean, all the energy companies, uh, green energy companies probably wouldn't survive if they didn't have all these subsidies and grants from the federal government and probably uh, tax credits as well. But I'm not opposed to tax credits uh, per se, because all it means is people are keeping more of their own money. And so that leads me to uh, 
a discussion we could have uh, next month because next month is uh, income tax day, April 17th this year, because the 15th is on a uh, Saturday. And I wrote the book of how to get rid of the income tax, tax free 2000. So between taxes, spending, regulation, Fed policy, this is this is American fascism, economic fascism, and we're getting close to political fascism as well because um, the uh, the assault on free speech today and it is is just stunning. It's absolutely stunning, and ironically, it's the media that supposedly has First Amendment protections that are le- that are leading the charge for more restrictions on free speech. So fascism has been really growing in America for the past ninety years since the New Deal. And we just have to nip it in the bud. And that's really the uh, the um, career that I have now. I, I call it restoring the republic, the, the republic of uh, that the founders envisioned, that I took an oath to uphold, uh, Michael, when I became a U.S. citizen in 1959, raised my right hand in lower Manhattan and became a U.S. citizen to uphold the Constitution. And when I ran for the U.S. Senate in New Jersey, that was, what, that was my mantra. We have to adhere to the principles of the Bill of Rights and Articles 1, Section 8 of what government is allowed to spend money on based upon the Constitution. And that's the other point I I want to bring to your attention and your uh, viewers' attention. We have a constitutional crisis that no one in Washington is talking about, namely that the federal government is spending money that's not authorized by the Constitution. And if we had that debate, a real honest debate about Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, instead of scaring people, you know, I've written on my Substack column how we can phase out these programs that are not authorized. If uh, the federal government wanted to have these programs, they should have passed the constitutional amendment, just as they passed the constitutional amendment for alcohol prohibition with the 18th amendment. If you, if, if you want to do something that's not authorized by the constitution, amend the constitution. We amended the constitution to get an income tax because the Supreme Court ruled the income tax was unconstitutional in 1895. So we have a quote, a democratic method to increase the size of government if the, if the statist, if the big government types wanted to, but they're circumventing the Constitution by passing laws, executive orders, that's given us what we have today in 2023, which is unfortunately a very managed economy. And one of the points I keep on making to people is that there is enough entrepreneurship and free enterprise in this country, which provides us with all the goods and services that we desire. And it won't forever. That's the, that, well, that's the whole mm-hmm. point. We have to make sure that the, the, the people in charge reverse course. Otherwise, one day, all our financial transactions will be at the mercy of the federal government. All our yeah. consumption decisions will be at the mercy of the federal government with a, uh, a, a central bank digital currency. That is the most, that's the greatest danger facing the American people. And they better wake up to this. You know, it's funny to me, you mentioned Article 1, Section 8, because I frequently have debates with people on both sides of the aisle. When when I'm arguing with liberals, I'll ask them, well, you tell me, Article 1, Section 8, where does it authorize Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, any of these programs that you love? And conservatives who are very anti-immigrant, I say, well, you show me where it gives them the authority to outlaw people from coming into the country. And it simply doesn't. But people like the Constitution when it suits their purposes, not when it doesn't. But I want to move on to the SVB, uh, Silicon Valley Bank. Now, again, partisan stripes are showing. On the left, they're saying, oh, it's deregulation caused this problem. And the conservatives are saying, no, it's the wokest policies of the the bank that are causing this problem. But I'm inclined to think that there's a far more logical, very Austrian explanation for this. And and I was hoping that you could shed some light on that for us. Yeah, there have been articles uh, by uh, people from the Austrian perspective uh, and various websites, which do a great job. I I, I, uh, um, had a post the other day on Substack with links to those articles. Basically, it comes down to this. The Federal Reserve flooded the economy with money since the 2008 financial crisis and, of course, the uh, the implosion of 2020. That money has to find a home somewhere. If some of that money found its home in Silicon Valley Bank, in the venture capital people that were funding startups in Silicon Valley, because that's where you can make a lot of money. Think of people who bought um, Google back in the, the day before they became an IPO and Apple and so on and so forth. This is where you can make a lot of money if you have a successful company or Facebook or, or any of the other startups in Silicon Valley. So the money was in Silicon Valley, lots of money, billions and billions of dollars. Unfortunately, the startups 
were putting the money that they got from the venture capital into Silicon Valley Bank because they need a banker. But what is unbelievable is that why would companies put money in a bank over the $250,000 limit? If you have a lot of cash, like Berkshire Hathaway and some of the big mega com uh, cap companies in America, they put their excess cash into treasury bills and they can always draw down their treasury bills if they need it. So you only keep a minimum amount of cash in a bank and then you use your, uh, you could have a money market fund, a government uh, treasury only money market fund at Fidelity or Vanguard or anyone's and have check writing privileges from there. So you have a symbiotic relationship between the Silicon Valley startups and the banks, because they were getting some special deals, they were getting probably above uh, in, above market interest rates for maybe some of the savings accounts that they had. But you wouldn't put money above 250000 in a bank because that's not good money management. I mean, uh, any individual doesn't do that. So why would a company do that? And so here is another example of how, how the Fed distorted the economy, creating billion, trillions of dollars, and that money wound up in areas of the uh, country where there were where there's cronyism going on and that money um, was used to uh, give loans help uh, working capital with the uh, startups and then there was a rumor that the bank was in trouble because what the bank did and this is again incredible uh, or maybe not so incredible they took their excess cash and bought long-term treasury bonds when yields were less than 2% or 2%. Well, when the Fed started raising interest rates, what happens to interest rates? They go up and the value of those bonds go down. So now the bank was sitting with uh, paper losses on their long-term treasury holdings. And so people got very nervous who knew the inside uh, structure of the banks and the balance sheet of the banks. And they st uh, started saying, maybe we should take our money out of the bank. And then you, that's uh, precipitates a bank run. So again, you have the perfect storm, easy money, venture capital, um, crony banking, and of course, um, fractional reserves, which is a real problem of the banking system. So everything came together that Austrians have been um, arguing about shouldn't be done in the financial system, yet it's being done routinely. And that's why you have banks, uh, the, the mid-sized banks, the regional banks have difficulty because they don't have a diversified portfolio in terms of loans. And they don't have a diversified portfolio in terms of geography. The big banks do. The Chases, uh, the J.P. Morgan Chase uh, banks, uh, Citibank, Wells Fargo, they have very diversified portfolios and they have better risk management compared to the smaller banks. So again, and the wokeism, um, I mean, when a bank is touting um, the, the gender and all the identities of their people that run the bank, what does it have to do with sound banking practices? I mean, this is how far we've gone away from sound financial and economic principles to this crazy notion that uh, gender and identity are, are important elements of, of governing uh, uh, companies and banks. It, I read Human Action in, I think, 2002, so about 21 years ago. And something that's always, I don't know, surprised or shocked me or bewildered me the Austrian theory of the trade cycle and its logical elegance is superb. And not only that, but while Irvin Fisher, the monetarist, and Keynes, the, the founder of Keynesianism, both lost money in the Great Depression, neither saw it coming. Both thought that the markets could thrive as far as the eye can see. Meanwhile, Hayek and Mises, the Austrians, predicted it. And yet the Austrian theory is almost completely ignored by mainstream economics. Why is that the case? Well, it's very simple. The um, FDR was doing basically what Hoover was doing, spending a lot of money. The Federal Reserve was pumping money in um, after the banks started to go, go under uh, with bank runs in the uh, uh, 1932. And so the Keynesianism provided intellectual protection for what the government was already doing. And so we know that government officials love more, more economic power. And so you had a, a, a intellectual rationale for what they were already doing. And uh, FDR, without probably reading anything of Keynes, I think they had the, a personal conversation or, uh, or co correspondence. Um, FDR was not the swiftest guy in terms of education, but he understood power. He understood that 
uh, the more things government does, uh, the more things people will look to government for solutions. So uh, they kept on spending. They, they he gave a social security, and uh, he realized that um, you couldn't include a, a, a medical component uh, to it. So he was the he was the ultimate politician, uh, uh, the premier politician of the 20th century, where he took a crisis that Hoover oversaw because he did everything wrong, which. Murray Rothbard outlines in America's Great Depression. Uh, and that book was 60 years old. It uh, was published in 1963. A phenomenal case study of the Great Depression, the events leading up to it, what happened during the Depression, and Hoover's downfall in 1932 when he ran for re-election and got wiped out by uh, Roosevelt, who, by the way, ran on a very fiscal conservative platform. Most people don't know that. So, uh, yeah, p politicians are looking for ways to increase their power. This is the iron law of bureaucracy, as we know. Uh, bureauc bureaucracies don't um, uh, decline on their own. It's, it's, uh, they decline because uh, they do really dumb things. And what FDR done, did was solidify, and so did Johnson, the welfare warfare state in America. And that's what we're dealing with. And both parties are responsible for it. And this is the important point from the political angle. Both parties are responsible. No one wants to cut the uh, military budget uh, drastically, which should be done. Uh, no one wants to cut uh, entitlements. No one wants to phase out Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. Because my contention is anything that could be done in the private sector, the nonprofit sector, should not be done by the government. And um, that's the point I argue in Tax Free 2000, how we can phase out all these mega programs. And that book is nearly 30 years old. And I just outline how this could be done. But the politicians love to, to uh, latch on to any kooky theory which gives them more power. And that's exactly what's happened because there's no way this can stand scrutiny. I mean, the Austrian school has written, God knows how many hundreds of books, thousands of articles. Uh, uh, Proponents have been on TV and radio, and yet uh, they're deaf in Washington, which means they're either incredibly dumb or they know what's going on and they're lying to themselves and the American people about what should be done. And this is the, I think, the, the poison of American politics is that are there any honest politicians in Washington, D.C. Who, who can diagnose the problems correctly and offer humane solutions? And the free market is humane construct because it's based upon voluntarism it's not based upon coercion and uh, that's why although the austrian school is not libertarian per se it, it is the basis for a lot of libertarian uh, uh, policy solutions namely keep your hands off the economy and let men and women entrepreneurs do what they do best which is create goods and services that the public wants who could be opposed to that but there's a school of thought from Bernie Sanders on down, that the government can manage the economy. And this is what the Fed believes. This is what uh, Biden and his um, uh, cronies believe, that the government can manage the economy. Plus, the, uh, the other co component is there are businesses that love big government. I mean, Warren Buffett's a good example of that. Uh, even though he doesn't say so outright, he's a capitalist, he claims, but uh, he, he wants uh, government to provide for the needy. Well, he's got $100 billion. He's Let giving... him provide for the needy. Well, he's doing that. He's <laughs> giving away 4% of his money to the Gates Foundation. And um, uh, so why the Gates Foundation is beyond me. But there are other institutions he can give to that would, organizations that would be more helpful. Habitat for Humanity is, is a one example. If you want uh, affordable housing for low income folks, Habitat Humanity does a great job all over the country. We just donated some money to them here in Southwest Florida where we moved to uh, two years ago. So uh, I, we donate money to nonprofit health centers in New Jersey where, where we live for many years because they're doing a great job without any uh, government money. They're doing it all through donations. So we have a, a vibrant nonprofit sector that I argue should be expanded by reducing taxes so people will have more funds to do the things that the government thinks it's doing a good job, but it's doing a lousy job because uh, uh, people are so dependent upon Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, and these entitlement programs and there's a better way to create prosperity to make and this is the, this is the really key point adults should be financially independent as they can't be the nonprofit organizations can help them become financially independent and it all stems down from getting an education which was drilled into me when we 70 years ago when we moved to the bronx and my parents said to me get an education so you become something of yourself uh, and so that's 
That's what I learned when I was in the second grade. Get an education so you can have a skill to be um, uh, an independent uh, adult. I'm glad you brought up your education because I actually wanted to pivot to a little bit about you. So over the weekend, knowing you were coming on, I had the opportunity and I read your autobiography. So tell us, how does somebody go from being starting off a poor student then wanting to be a social social studies teacher, I think it was, end up moving on to geography, then to finance, and finally to becoming a libertarian candidate for governor in New Jersey and the first ever to be allowed on the debate stage. How does that happen? Because that is just fascinating. And I think it's important because so many people out there think that – we, we live in this two-party binary and there's no other options. Now, I'm, a, I'm the spokesperson for the Libertarian Party of Connecticut and a local talk show host, not Todd Feinberg, another one said to me, oh, but you're just going to split the vote. And that to me is so offensive because you're assuming like I owe a Republican yeah. my vote. First of all, they don't do what they say they're going to do. And even what they say they're going to do is not that appealing to me. So why should I, to me, that's the wasted vote, not voting for a libertarian, but voting for a Republican. So I just was very fascinated with your story. So how does that happen? How did you bring all that together to end up where you, and now, you know, you've run for Senate, you're a public intellectual. I, I think it's very fascinating. And I just would like to be people to hear it. Well, when I was going to grade school in, in the Bronx, uh, I, I really enjoyed social studies. because I thought it was fascinating to learn about uh, different parts of the world. And then when I was uh, 13, um, when you're Jewish, you, you have a bar mitzvah. And uh, I got a wonderful atlas from a, a couple that uh, came to the uh, reception. And I just immersed myself. Remember, this is December 1959, when nations were becoming uh, independent in Africa. The colonialism was on its wane, and I saw all these countries being formed in Africa, and I said, this is fascinating stuff. And in junior high school, I decided to become a social studies teacher. I, I had originally thought of being an architect, but I took a mechanical drawing class in 10th grade, and I said, uh, I don't really think I'm really good at this, and I don't have the fire and belly to pursue architecture, even though... I really wish I had the fire in the belly to do so and uh, applied myself to do to become an architect. But anyway, I became a social studies teacher, started teaching in the South Bronx in the tumultuous year of 1968. Uh, we had the assassinations in the spring. Uh, we had a teacher strike uh, that greeted us in September of 1968. And um, it was a very difficult year uh, personally. And then um, there were too many social studies teachers in, in the school. And so they asked me to teach math because I had a pretty good math background going to the Bronx High School of Science. And I really enjoyed math, but that is not the career I wanted. And so uh, after a couple of years, I decided to uh, get a PhD in geography because I really wanted to teach at the college level to have more intellectual stimulation. So I applied to uh, Rutgers, got in, I started full time in uh, uh, September of 1972 and I almost became the last person drafted in America because uh, the, the draft was, uh, you were available to the draft until you were 26, and I was going to be 26 in December of 1972, so I was called for a pre-induction physical uh, as a full-time graduate student, and then um, I turned 26, and the draft board wrote me a letter saying, you're no longer eligible for the draft, uh, good luck, and then a month later, Nixon ended the draft in January of 1973, so I got, I started for my PhD, met Murray Rothbard in April of 1974, I invited him to become a uh, member of my dissertation committee and uh, told him that I was going to use his um, his analysis in Man, Economy, and State to uh, study inflation and the U.S. economy. He was thrilled. He got me an invitation to the first Austrian economics conference in uh, Vermont in June of 1974. And I uh, met all these young economists uh, uh, and the speakers there, including Rothbard. Henry Hazlitt was there, the great uh, journalist. Um, 80 years old, he was sharp as a tack, and uh, I just immersed myself in his readings of the economy. And uh, much, I think in my curiosity about the world we live in has sort of dri driven me to study economics, finance, history, geography, political science. And uh, the doctorate um, was an important element in, in this because I just read a ton of material in the 1970s and uh, started working in the late 70s. And those jobs, as you read, didn't turn out too well. And uh, uh, because of they didn't turn out too well, I eventually got my teaching job at Ramapo in 1985 and had a 35-year career teaching finance because I was working as a staff 
F economist, as a investment analyst in commercial real estate. So I had the basic skills that you needed to teach uh, finance at the undergraduate level without having a PhD in finance. And so for 35 years, uh, students really liked my classes because I, they gave me good reviews and especially the, my financial history of the United States class, which was just a wonderful course where students got to learn how our system evolved over 200 years. And then in uh, the spring of 1997, I got a call from the um, chairman of the New Jersey LP, Libertarian Party, saying, would you like to run for governor? I said, well, it's not on my radar screen this year, but uh, let me th uh, think it over, speak to my wife, speak to the president of the college to see if there'd be any conflicts, speak to the dean of the business school. Um, they all said, OK, so I decided to go ahead with it. And we had a very simple goal, raise enough money to get the matching funds, which required me to be in the three debates with Whitman and McGree. Governor Whitman, the Republican, and Jim McGreevy, the state senator and mayor of uh, Woodbridge, New Jersey. And so I, I went toe to toe with them for three uh, times. And um, the consensus, and I write about some of the um, uh, letters that came into the uh, Star Ledger about uh, who won the debates and what they published was uh, people had very insightful comments about how I presented ideas that would help the people of New Jersey. And the point I'm, I'm, I keep on making is that as a third party candidate, you don't have to win to affect policy. For example, we had a 55 speed limit in New Jersey. I said we should have 65 because um, the roads in New Jersey, the turn practice Garden State Parkway, Route 80, they're meant to, for people to go 65. Well, Whitman and McGreevy were opposed to it because seniors were opposed to it because they did polling. Well, six months after um, Whitman won, one re-election. What did she do? She raised the speed limit to 65. I also called for automobile insurance uh, deregulation because that would drive down prices. We know deregulation drives down prices, just as Jimmy Carter showed in the late 70s. By deregulating all the major industries, prices came down, telecommunications, trucking, transportation, other industries. And so uh, when McGreevy got elected in 2001, Whitman didn't deregulate the industry, which is a mantra of Republican politics. He deregulated the automobile insurance industry. And guess what? Auto insurance rates went down, more companies came into the marketplace, and that issue was off the table. In addition, we struck a blow for free speech because one day I came home during the campaign and there was a note in my mailbox from a sergeant in my town saying you violated an ordinance that you're not allowed, you're not allowed to have political signs on your own property, a gross violation of the First Amendment. Our campaign attorney went to the Superior Court judge who immediately threw it out. So that's part of case law in the state of New Jersey, that you're allowed to have your, a political sign on your own property. So third party candidates tend not to win. But if you look at the 1912 Socialist Party platform, Michael, oh my Lord, everything has been enacted by and both Republicans, Republicans and supporting Democrats. It. And Republicans support it. Yep. <laughs> Everything from Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, minimum uh, wage, minimum wage, uh, housing subsidies, uh, trade restrictions. I mean, you name it. Uh, I mean, and the scary part is, and people have been talking about this in the Republican Party circles, uh, is that if you look at the Communist Manifesto, I think six out of the 10 uh, planks of the Communist Manifesto have been enacted. I mean, <laughs> how is that possible in a country? that had a cold war against the evil empire, as Reagan called it, the Soviet Union. So we've embraced a lot of the uh, principles, policies that Karl Marx uh, advocated in the Communist Manifesto. How is this possible in a nation that lauds itself as exceptional and a leader of the free world when we're implementing more and more status policies? I think I read over the weekend that we're now the 16th most economically free uh, yep. country in the world. That means 15 ahead of us. Okay, Dr. Sabrin. So tell us the name of your book and tell the audience where they can find you. It's uh, From Immigrant to Public Intellectual and American Story. All my books are available on Amazon. The six books that I published, four were written uh, since I retired in uh, July of 2020. I've written four books. Uh, Two on healthcare, one on the boom bust cycle, navigating the boom bust cycle, and uh, financing healthcare. And the latest one is the, uh, uh, which was published, interestingly, on the day that Kennedy was assassinated, November twenty second. And of course, that is a, a, an event that haunts my generation, the baby boomers, because I was a senior in high school when that happened, and uh, that really changed the course not only of American history but probably of world history, because Johnson got us involved in Vietnam. Uh, uh, in the summer of 1965, that was a fateful month. In July of 65, 
we get the escalation of the Vietnam War and the passage of Medicare and Medicaid, changing the course of American history forever and probably a world history because of this notion that we are responsible for nations to be free of communist domination. And uh, the North Vietnamese took over the South. I don't think any American has lost sleep since 1975 when that happened. And now here we are, deja vu again. Um, we're fighting a proxy war in Ukraine against Russia, which is the total insanity because one mistake can lead us to a nu nuclear exchange. And I remember very clear um, the Cuban Missile Crisis. So I have that all in my book. So Amazon has all the books. I write on Substack twice a week. And um, it's great being um, in retirement from teaching and doing what I like to do best, which is to express the principles that underlay this country, namely freedom, free enterprise, a non-interventionist foreign policy, sound money, low taxes, or in my case, I would prefer we don't have any whatsoever. But the point is, we have to move the needle to where the founders wanted us to be. And instead, we're going in the opposite direction. And Biden has accelerated that process exponentially in the last two years since he's been president. And that's the danger of the Biden presidency is that he's just gone over the top in terms of um, wokeness and um, Green New Deal and um, and uh, interventionism. So uh, we have a lot to do to educate the American people about what is the best policy for us for peace and prosperity. Well, I hope you'll join us again so we can keep educating them. Thank you very much, Dr. Saber, and I appreciate you being here. And thank you for joining us. For now, this is The Rational Egoists. We'll see you next time.